even living in this country, Western world, 21st century, still they believe, okay, I don't want to talk about it. Or if I talk about it, that's, you know, outrageous. I mean, I'm breaking the taboo. Speaking out in San Diego, the women who are using their pain to raise awareness about a violent ritual. And preparing for battle online, the Marines at Miramar training in the largest cyber warfare exercise ever. Something they'd be happy to wake up to and go to their job each day. The innovation station that's helping kids get excited about engineering. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. San Diego's Planning Commission has delayed a decision on planning the community in San Isidro, but Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says it did so under the threat of a lawsuit. San Isidro's community plan was last updated in 1990. The new plan uses zoning changes to encourage higher density housing and mixed use commercial development. That's to comply with the city's climate action plan, which requires more car free connections between homes and jobs. But some environmental groups say the city has failed to prove that all these changes to zoning will actually do that. Commissioner Teresa Quiros agrees. This is our first community plan update after the approval of the Climate Action Plan, and we need to get this right. We need a template that will dictate how future plans are handled. We need to get this right so that we don't make a mockery of our Climate Action Plan that was put forward by the mayor and endorsed by the city council. The Planning Commission will revisit the San Isidro Community Plan update in October. City staffers will then give an update on their efforts to quantify how this update will meet the Climate Action Plan goals. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. A two-block section of San Diego South Park neighborhood was hand-sprayed with pesticide today to prevent mosquito-borne illnesses. County health officials say a person who lives in the area recently traveled to regions with diseases like dengue, fever, and Zika, and it appears to have symptoms. The county says spraying will prevent the disease from spreading to mosquitoes and then to other people. County Vector Control says the pesticides pose low risk to people and pets. In Florida, officials have identified a second area of Zika transmission on the U.S. mainland. Miami's South Beach is connected to at least five cases of Zika. That brings the state's caseload to 36 infections not related to travel outside of the U.S. Officials say containing it there will be difficult because of high-rise buildings and strong winds, making spraying in the air impractical. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is warning pregnant women to avoid the area if possible. At least 96 Southern California families have lost their homes. Fire officials estimate the Blue Cut Fire also destroyed more than 200 other structures. The blaze, burning about 60 miles east of Los Angeles, has scorched nearly 58 square miles. A small number of evacuees have been allowed to return home. It's about 26 percent contained. Firefighters are tackling six major wildfires in California right now. Marine Corps Air Station Miramar is part of one of the largest cyber warfare exercises in Marine Corps history. KBBS reporter Steve Walsh says the critical training is happening right now. So we're out here at Miramar. Now it doesn't look like very much out here. A lot of tents, a lot of camo, uh, pretty quiet outside here. But inside, uh, it's the hub of a very large scale cyber exercise really the largest cyber exercise ever conducted by the Marine Corps. 30 feet More than 3,000 Marines, sailors, and civilians are taking part in the exercise, stretched between Miramar, Pendleton, 29 Palms, Barstow, and Quantico, Virginia. They're simulating what it's like to fight a country which has just as much access to technology as the U.S. We have spent 15 years now in sustained land campaigns, largely in what we call counterinsurgency type of environments. And we do not denigrate, we praise the service of our Marines and sailors, we mourn the losses, but what we're working on here is a horse of a different color. 
The entire operation took about 10 months to plan. Some of the questions they're trying to answer include, how do you react to social media coming out of an opposing country? And especially difficult for younger warriors, how do you keep fighting even when the enemy knocks out all of this expensive technology? Steve Walsh, KPBS News. Support for military coverage is provided by the Patriots Connection, a program of the Rancho Santa Fe Foundation. Within 30 days, San Diego's Gas and Electric can begin lobbying against local cities' plans to create alternative energy programs called Community Choice Aggregation. Community Choice is one option San Diego is considering to reach its goal of using only renewable energy in 20 years. Under state law, SDG&E is prohibited from lobbying against Community Choice unless it forms an independent district that's funded by shareholders, not rate payers. Now that's exactly what has happened. The California Public Utilities Commission has officially approved the independent district. After years of planning, Hollywood Casino is set to open in Hamul, but there's some drama before the opening night and dozens of people came out to explain just why. I want to welcome all of you to the Hollywood Horror Show. Waving signs, the people here are decidedly against the soon to open Hollywood Casino. This casino that's behind us is close to opening and it will open on already what is a very, very dangerous state highway. We are looking at a disaster in the making. Led by San Diego County Supervisor Diane Jacob, this group argues the casino will make a rural stretch of State Road 94 even more dangerous. They say from Rancho San Diego to Hamul, there have been more than 1,000 car accidents since 2005. Hundreds of people have been injured, 23 to date have been killed. Opponents say the two-lane highway can't support the thousands of extra vehicles the casino will attract. When you add alcohol to the mix, which they're going to provide at the casino, that's a recipe for disaster. I fear for my family, let alone all my friends and people, other people that live here in Hamul. I don't understand why a casino needs to go in right here when there's one right at Saquon. The people here are asking for road improvements, including a retaining wall and new signals. This with the casino's opening just days away. County supervisors in Hamul Indian Village approved an agreement in April on how to handle the casino's impact. It covers traffic and environmental effects. Tribal government leaders say they have been negotiating with the county for more than two years to reach an agreement because they are good neighbors. Nearly one and a half, one million faith and community leaders from across the country have marched for 11 days from San Diego to Los Angeles. The 150 mile march is intended to call attention to the plight of immigrants. The walk starts tomorrow morning at the Borderfield State Park. Organizers also hope the event will highlight the need for immigration reform in Congress. New images released by the U.S. Border Patrol are drawing attention to poor conditions inside immigration holding cells in southern Arizona. A federal judge ordered the release of photos as a part of a class action lawsuit that was filed to pressure the agencies to improve conditions. The images depict immigrant men, women and babies huddled together on the floor to keep warm. What we are asking uh, the court is to ensure that at a minimum, Border Patrol abides by its own meager standards. Federal prosecutors argued against the release of these images. Last year, the judge in the case accused the agency of purposely destroying videotape recordings. The Border Patrol has declined to comment. Border Patrol agents from El Centro caught a deported sex offender today who was trying to make his way back into the U.S. Officers saw him running north of, of Calidex Grand Plaza outlet early this morning. Records show the man from El Salvador was convicted of assault to commit rape. Border Patrol agents have arrested 13 convicted sex offenders trying to cross the border this year. There was an emotional debate over child prostitution at the state capitol. Assembly, assembly members approved a bill that would decriminalize it. The measure would still allow law enforcement to detain underage prostitutes under limited circumstances to protect minors' health or safety. If we're going to continue to say, no, no, we can't do that, we still need to arrest these kids for their own protection, it means we're, we're really relying on antiquated notions of law enforcement and society. We've moved on. The bill now returns to the Senate. 
This next story is shocking to many Americans. It's about female genital mutilation, a subject that's often taboo. In part two of a special report, KPBS Frontiers reporter Jean Guerrero and video journalist Katie Shula follow a San Diego woman who's hoping to break those taboos. Some of her story is very difficult to watch, so we want to warn you that you may find it disturbing. Okay, thank you. It's before dawn. Somali refugee Maha Hussein is already nervous. Her husband Billy has brought her to Sharp Chulavis's outpatient surgery center for an unusual procedure. Her doctor is about to remove a large, life-threatening cyst from where her clitoris once was. It formed over more than 35 years of scar tissue damage from general mutilation done when she was five. Being nervous, I left my insurance at home. No worries. Maha is one of thousands of refugees yeah. mutilated as young girls in Africa and the Middle East. Years later, many suffer medical problems, but are too ashamed to seek treatment. I need a signature right here, please. Discussing general mutilations and fixing them is considered taboo. It's culture. It's, they still, even living in this country, Western world, 21st century, still they believe, okay, I don't want to talk about it. Or if I talk about it, that's, you know, outrageous. I mean, I'm breaking the taboo. Going to surgery, it's not easy, so. I'm excited for her process. Her husband, also a Somali refugee, is just as worked up about it as Maha is. Her health is really mine. I, I really, you know, value as, as mine, and I want to see her uh, healthy. Okay, we're going to go right in here. For 13 years, he's seen Maha suffer repeated infections, constant bleeding, and pain. Some husbands abandon women with so many health problems tied to their mutilations. When we lay you down, we'll put some stickers here. Not Billy. I love my children. I love my heart. General mutilation can range from partial removal of the clitoris to full-scale extraction of all labia and vulva and stapling the area shut. Maha's mutilation was the most severe. It's a wake-up call on the wall, you know, just to stop any more mutilation for anybody. You know, it's, it's, not, it's inhumane, basically. Everything they take it out. Meanwhile, Maha's friend Fatima Abdelrahman says she isn't interested in surgery. She was mutilated as a child in Sudan. She has what she describes as minor complications. But Fatima's mother died of problems that started like Maha's. This is my mom. Her mother refused to seek help because of the taboo. Fatima says if her complications were life-threatening like Maha's, she would seek help. But she's not interested in surgeries to lessen the pain she feels. For my culture, I feel like it's shame for me to do that one again. It's done. Fatima has a complex relationship with her roots. And this is our place, therefore... She's proud of her culture and made this poster showcasing African tradition. But she wishes mutilations would stop. It can be done in a generation. UC San Diego researcher Gerald Mackey has been studying female genital mutilation for decades and fighting against it. He says vilifying the perpetrators doesn't help because parents who do this don't mean to harm their daughters. But to be uncut means to be an unmarriageable girl. Until recently, in many African and Middle Eastern cultures where this takes place, marriage represented the apex of female success. Mutilations make it possible to find husbands. It becomes a, ma a sign of honor, modesty, chastity, fidelity. Mackey says mutilations stop in communities where enough men announce they're willing to marry intact women, and enough women stand up for their rights. Here's a girl who's a young b baby who's uncut. And over time, more and more people have changed. A Sudanese campaign having success is called Salima, which means whole or uncut. It's positive, see? The word is associated with this colorful, swirly brand. And it's community, see? A few days before his surgery, Maha visited her friend Fatima with her daughter, Sigal. Sigal has never been mutilated and never will be. But the friends wanted to demonstrate what a mutilation ritual is like. Fatima had decorated her home the way Sudanese women prepare for the ritual. It's like a party involving friends and neighbors and relatives. A wig is placed on the little girl. Wow, this is gift for you, okay? Everyone tries to make the girl feel special and happy. And you grab the henna, you say, I know! Then they stain her fingertips with henna mud. If you keep it, your hand becomes like my hand. Eventually, 
The girl is placed on a special stool. And there is a woman, she's going to be behind her. Holding, holding her to not cry. This is when the mutilation would take place. Yeah, she itself is very nice. And she put it like this in the skin, and she push it, and she cut like this. So when she do this one, she cut everything out. All right, we've started already, OK? Maha wanted to be awake for her procedure. Maha's doctor, Latanya Lee, oh, that's work. slowly cuts away at the large growth over where Maha's clitoris once was. That's a blow for freedom. The cyst has been growing and interfering with Maha's ability to urinate, which can cause renal failure or even death if left untreated. It's also causing incessant bleeding. Oh, okay, we're at the end. Here we go. After about an hour, Dr. Lee has completely removed this cyst. It's about three inches long and two inches wide. Everything went well, dissected out the cyst. It will take Maha six to eight weeks to heal. Maha says she hopes her story encourages other mutilated women with problems to see a doctor. It's good always to diagnose early before it's too late. And they can be um, helped feel much better, confident. She and her husband hope their lives will be more normal now. I'm really happy and relieved and grateful. You see my face? <laughs> I'm happy. Jean Guerrero, KPBS I'm News. There may be a Trump effect in San Diego political races this November. And we take a closer look at the number of straw donors to the Bonnie DeManis mayoral campaign. Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 8.30. Looks like a warm weekend in San Diego. Stephanie Olma has that in tonight's KPBS weather report. Well, it's looking like another quiet night throughout SoCal. As we check out the weather conditions, satellite and radar just still on the Golden State here, not looking at a whole lot from northern areas down south. A little different story just around uh, southern Nevada, parts of the Four Corners region, still looking at monsoonal moisture. That's producing showers and even the chance for a pop-up storm. But we're in the clear here in San Diego and the surrounding areas. As we check out the conditions for the night, clear skies, but then we'll see the increase amounts of clouds develop mainly late in the night. Early start to the day, we'll see the cloud cover linger. Temperatures will be back down into the middle to upper 60s. Not too bad of a night. Pretty comfortable weather conditions in the area here. Around Ramona, we're back down into the 50s. 56 there. 53, a bit cooler in Mount Laguna. Borrego Springs, mild at 74 degrees. Around uh, Oceanside, we'll be taking a tumble back at 63 with the chance to see increasing amounts of clouds here as well. Mainly Mainly focused toward the overnight hours. So all in all, just quiet conditions throughout Southern California. As we take into the first part of the weekend, it is going to be hot throughout the Southwest region, a bit cooler along the coast. Also, another thing I have to point out for the beachgoers this weekend, we are concerned for large swells. So make sure to keep an eye on the orders for those heading out here in the beaches across the interior sections with the limited moisture in place. We're still looking at the chance for some pop up showers and storms. We're not talking about anything too widespread, though, uh, mainly focused in the Four Corners region. They, I put the emphasis on spotty here both days, Saturday and Sunday. So now checking out your extended outlook here first along the coast where we can expect tranquil weather conditions this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. So any plans should be OK. Temperatures will be in the 70s and then increasing to 80 degrees on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, keeping things pretty quiet. A foggy start to the day, but then we'll see that sunshine start to break through through as we check out what's in store for uh, this weekend further inland. Also here as well, looking at plenty of sunshine both days, Saturday and Sunday. Sunny skies will remain the trend on Monday as many folks head back to work should be fine. And temperatures all across the board, anywhere between the middle 80s up into the upper 80s, pretty much each and every day. In the mountains this weekend, plenty of sunshine, pretty mild in the 80s. Low 80s this uh, weekend, 82 to start up the new work week on Monday with plenty of sunshine and sunny skies will remain the story Tuesday and Wednesday as well. Last but not least, checking out what's going on, your extended outlook here in the desert. We will remain in the triple digits pretty much each and every day into the new week and plenty of sunshine here as well. So enjoy the weekend if you can. Stephanie Omo, KPBS News. 
The San Diego Zoo is treating a white rhino that may have been shot by poachers in South Africa. Wallace is one of six female rhinos that were relocated to San Diego's Safari Park from private reservoirs, reser reservoirs in South Africa last November. She has already undergone two procedures to heal the wound. The white rhino is critically endangered. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. Lo and behold, we sit down with filmmaker Werner Herzog about his new movie on our connected world. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. Latinas in low income areas are one and a half times more likely to die from chronic disease than the general population. The San Diego nonprofit Project Concern International works with the community, primarily women, to make healthier lifestyle choices. Connie LaFuente says working with women is key. I think the influence that women have is big. Women are like the nucleus of the family. So if we teach women on how to have better healthy habits or how to exercise or have better nutrition, they will also serve as examples to the rest of their family members. La Fuente says the mortality rate for Latina women in City Heights, Sherman Heights, Logan Heights and National City are higher than anywhere in the country. La Perla Ladesma went through PCI's training and now works as a promotora in City Heights. When you are promotora, you uh, promote health, good habits, exercise, promote different programs to help you be healthy. I know how to prevent disease. It's like a goal in your hands because many people, they don't know. They don't know and sometimes when you share this important thing, it makes you feel so good when you do something good for someone else. Project Concern International's community health worker or promotora trainings are held weekly and a new program starts in September. Brian Myers from the Media Arts Center produced that story. Last week, we showed you a lab at Qualcomm that's getting middle school girls interested in engineering. Now, the Chula Vista School District is giving more kids the experience with a lab at the Chula Vista Library. KPBS education reporter Megan Burks visited and has the report. This once empty basement room of the Chula Vista Library is now an innovation station filled with bean bags, a 3D printer, and computers. I'm here with sixth grader Pete Estrada. Pete, what are you working on? Uh, right now, we're working on, or we're working with servos, which are like tiny little motors that help something spin. So, like we did, we put popsicle sticks onto the servo along with the panda, so that would spin. We connected to the wire. We connected the wires to an Arduino which helps it spin because it gives it the power from the computer. The district hired an engineering teacher to run the lab. He says sixth graders visiting from the district's 45 schools will be doing much more than tinkering with robotics. We want them to start looking into a career, the education that goes behind it based on what they're interested in, something they'd be happy to wake up to and go to their job each day. Now this $86,000 facility came together through a partnership of the city of Chula Vista, Friends of the Chula Vista Library, Qualcomm, and the California State Librarian. When it's not filled with kids, it's going to be open to veterans and other adults who want to expand their career horizons and get into a STEM field. Reporting from Chola Vista, I'm Megan Burks. Volunteers stuffed backpacks with school supplies, socks, and shoes at St. Mark's Church in City Heights this week. They'll pass them out and offer haircuts to refugee school children at a celebration tomorrow. Anthony Dramani's family came to San Diego last year from a refugee camp in Uganda. He's heading to 10th grade and says he wants to become a doctor. The things they do help the kids, like to, to encourage, yeah, and um, to improve and help help in their future. St. Mark's Back to School Bash is scheduled for 9 to 1 at its Fairmont Avenue facility. The church expects to hand out about 350 backpacks. The return of rugby to the Olympics this year has brought renewed attention to the sport, and now kids can learn the game for free in City Heights. At Copley YMCA, kids aged 7 to 12 years old can learn rugby basics. It's happening next 
the next two Sundays, a longtime rugby athlete and YMCA board member, Harley Losey, runs the clinics. He says he'll help kids of all skills stay active and teach them discipline, respect, and a sense of community. Everybody is welcome, boys, girls, big, small, slow, fast, it doesn't matter. So the kids that weren't able to, to get passionate about, say, soccer or baseball or football, uh, we wanted to give them a home, you know, a place to go. The 2 p.m. Sunday clinics conclude after this month, but Losi hopes to continue spreading the word about rug rugby and enthusiasm through the YMCA's after-school programs. Paving the way for future spaceships, spacewalking astronauts have installed a new front door at the International Space Station. The chore took six hours. The new addition is meant to welcome commercial crew capsules as soon as next year. NASA's last shuttle flight was in 2011. It's a setback for the boys of summer from Chula Vista at the Little League World Series today. Parkview Little League lost their first game this afternoon against Iowa. The score was 5-1. to one. They have one more shot to stay in the series. Parkview plays an elimination game tomorrow night at 5. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening.